Welcome back to PR After Hours. I'm your host, Alex Greenwood, bringing you your weekly cocktail of PR and marketing tips that will help you and your business. Hey, we'll get right to it after this message. Hello, listeners. It's me, Alex, from PR After Hours. I hope you're enjoying the show so far. And I wanted to talk to you just for a moment about the way I get this show right into your earbuds every week. It's because I use Anchor FM. Now, I've told you previously that I've been podcasting since 2006, back when we used stone knives and bear skins and a couple of Dixie cups and string. Anchor FM has really, really streamlined this and made it simpler for people who don't know the first thing about setting up a podcast or don't have you know time to learn all the pro tools and stuff because it's all right here. First thing it's important to know is it's free. There are certain tools that will allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will then distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. That's huge. Distribution is a big pain in the butt, to be honest with you, so it's really great Anchor FM can do that for you, and you're not paying hosting fees. That adds up every month. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. So download the free Anchor app or go to Anchor FM to get started. And be sure to join me in the Virtual Cocktail Lounge on PR After Hours. We've spoken so much about the value of public relations and marketing and the different tactics and things you can use. But one thing we haven't talked about much here on PR After Hours in the virtual lounge is design. And you're in luck, folks, because I managed to snag a buddy of mine, Jason McIntyre, and just dragged him into the virtual lounge. We're maintaining proper social distance, so I'm sliding a virtual teeny down the bar to him. And Jason is going to talk to us about graphic design and communications. He's been doing this kind of work for more than 20 years, and it's worked with private business, government agencies, nonprofits, and independent creators. As a writer himself, the last four years has seen his expansion into working with other authors and publishers to develop their branding, book design, and social media engagement to increase readership. Welcome to PR After Hours, Jason McIntyre. Thank you, Alex, for having me. Oh, it's good. it's good to have you. And I know you're doing a lot with book covers, and we'll get to that at the end. That's going to be my favorite part, I think. Um, but I wanted to talk now for the listeners out there. In particular, we have a pretty solid small business audience, but we also have PR practitioners. So talking to those two audiences in particular, what role, especially now during a global pandemic, should graphic design play in messaging to audiences? I would say... Um just looking at it now, more than probably any other time in my career designing for clients, it's apparent more so that the less is more approach to designing anything and communicating anything with any audience is huge. It's never been more clear that the best practice has always been and remains short, simple, no room to misinterpret, don't muddle with excess. There's so much noise in the news landscape, for example, so many channels that vie for our attention with conflicting facts about safety during this time of the worldwide pandemic. Companies, government, law enforcement, healthcare, they need to be extremely concise, not only with what they say, but how they say it visually, anything that needs to be communicated to their audience. So I think I'm hearing you say, don't get too fancy on us. Exactly. Um, in terms of design specifically, no matter what you're looking at, billboards, advertising, the web, they need to be simple. And the repetition of, you know, the same visual uh, look and feel of something married to the exact same messaging, it's, it's going to increase, I think, out of necessity because of the noise, the competition in the landscape. Companies, I think, many are fighting for survival. And I, what I'm seeing is the wise ones are actually looking to design professional designers, professional PR people to keep them top of mind for their customers while they're perhaps closed for business or while they have to modify um, how they deliver their service or, or their product. You know, uh, the Duke Cannon Supply Company, uh, they they have come out with this line of uh, Duke Cannon PSA posters that are hilarious. They're kind of in the spirit of World War II 
um, kind of, you know, everybody get on the same team kind of posters, right. you know, it's like, yep. the, you know, the famous picture of, uh, of, oh my goodness, I'm blanking on her name, but the woman who's get flexing uh, her right. bicep, you know, and, and they're like, for example, Backyard National Park, you know, see America at home or your local garage bar and lounge beer cooler stock daily but it's just the living room casino we'll put some links in the show notes to these but that's to me it sounds like a great way to do what you're talking about in a way here which is if you're fighting for survival and this is something we've talked to previous uh, guests on the show about if you're fighting for survival find a way to align your brand that is helpful but is not Mm -hmm. jarring and is not obviously like you're just trying to surf on a crisis i think duke cannon has done a good job by by bringing in some humor and making these posters printable. Uh, Any thoughts on that? For sure. Um, There's almost a sense of comfort in that kind of a way to deliver that message, which is a a probably could sound a bit weird comfort in these, in these war messages or repurposing of the, of the imagery from, from wartime. Mm -hmm. But I think for so many of us, I mean, I didn't live through wartime. Um, Those things are nostalgic to me. So there's a there's a connectivity in mind between what's happening now and how people pulled together during the war effort. So, yes, they have a little bit of humor with it. But I think there's this feeling of we did it before. We can do it again. We can pull together like we did in that time and look at the, you know, look at the amazing way that society went after, you know, World War Two, the growth and and how successful business was and, and that kind of thing. So I think there's almost like a subconscious um, connectivity between those ideas. And I, I agree with you, those kinds of messages delivered that way are pretty successful, I think. I think so too. I, I, I like them and I do, I find mm. them oddly comforting as well. It's, right. it's like the humor's there, but the, the quality of the art is excellent too. Yeah. Talking about that has, and I know you've kind of already touched on this, but has COVID-19 changed how you would do visual design for ads and posters like that? I mean, was, is that something that you would even dream of doing before this or you know you know what i'm saying i do i think this isn't really what you're getting at but i don't think any of us could have dreamed that this that we would be living in this world in 2020 so no i beforehand i there was no way to prep for this it's all unfolding and evolving with um you know with the changes in in our world day to day almost i think for me my view of it is i see customer frustration as rising quite a bit the ability to get groceries, for example, is like a huge undertaking. I mean, for me personally, with my family, it takes a half a day between, you know, all of the safety protocols and practices to get food into our home um, and get it from the, the store. So and this is understandable that these are people are stressed right now. So many people are stressed. Companies are closing their doors, either temporarily, permanently. The ones that can weather the storm, I think, are the ones who are cutting, who are not cutting their budgets for communications, PR, design. I think they're shifting it, like I said, kind of day to day, week to week, and focusing more on what what you were talking about, more on sensitivity of the message. In life, just as an example, and on the web, um, my interactions with my friends, with clients, with family, we're all saying the same thing at the end of our conversations. We're saying, stay safe. Yeah. And companies are tuning into that feeling of we're here to help you stay safe. We're here to help you manage, you know, banks are, are their messages. We'll help you look after your finances because we know they're really tough right now. I, I see the smart companies shifting um, their style, for lack of a better word, to having the sensitivity, the way that the, the ad sounds, the, you know, the font, the, the coloring, there's a, there's a, there's a softening of things. Hmm. They want us to understand how tough they know things are for us, emotionally, yeah. financially. And I'm I'm very big on advising my clients to stay human. <clears throat> I say this all the time: stay yes. human during this crisis. And you know, sometimes you get a raised eyebrow, even even yep. over a Zoom call. And I'm yep. saying, but yeah, but so what I love what you're saying here is that you're you're basically, if I'm hearing you correctly opting for a warm human approach, even mm-hmm. from a brand or a corporation or a business, right. you're saying, look, beyond the slick branding, we're all humans here. And that's mm-hmm. that's what's going to win the day as far as getting uh, getting across to people. Yeah. And I think even the smart, smart companies are <laughs> even shifting to become more human than we used to be. 
not not necessarily stay human like that's a great that's a great approach but a couple of the banks where i live national banks in canada they were very their advertising was quite cold and now it's actually becoming more human like their their approach is to really address us as individuals and people with needs right. whereas before it was you know maximize your profit return and it was very very um chilly before and it's they're almost becoming more human and i know it's i know that it's calculated sure I think that's okay, though. I think it's working for for certain certain kinds of companies. For me personally, in terms of like logistics and working with clients, it hasn't really um, changed too much for me. Um, I've usually worked long distance with clients, virtually, we'll call it, with email, messaging, conference tools. Uh, certainly, the last five or six years, I have. Mm-hmm. I do that more now with the local clients that I used to take in-person meetings with. Now it's, you know, Zoom type calls and that that sort of thing. Right. And interestingly, and you and I talked about this, there's more work right now for certain types of designers. Um, certainly signage people, the print shops are seeing a surge of, of work in Canada and the US. Grocery stores are implementing signage, for example, that dictate how customers can move through the store. Mm-hmm. You know, the arrows on the floor or how to remain at a safe distance while interacting with the staff. Now, certainly smaller mom and pop type businesses aren't going to use services of a design professional necessarily, but a large grocery chain isn't going to use Microsoft Word and an inkjet printer to educate their customers, right? right? So yeah. those bigger places that are, you know, they have PR people to educate them. They're using a longer term strategy, I think, to outfit their stores, their locations with warmth, I think, in a lot of the signage, mm. not just <laughs> not just all caps screaming, stay behind the line. <laughs> Healthcare, of course, yeah. uh, needs signage. And then there's this online component where your online presence needs to match up with your brick and mortar location for patients receiving treatment, their families understanding what can and can't be done. So organizations need designers. They need message makers, I think, who understand how cross-pollination between online and the physical store or location, how they need to be co-branded together, you know, to look and read and feel like they belong to that organization. It's, it's always been, I think, about trusting a brand, but now it's so much more crucial. I think so. And what I love to... About this too, and what I want to get across to both business owners who listen to the show and PR practitioners is that enlist a graphic designer as an ally, um, even if you don't necessarily need one for out of house. Maybe you think you can do things in house, and maybe you can. But it, it's always great, I think. And I've done this with you, Jason, many times. Correct? I, I pulled you in and said, "Look, this is what I'm thinking of doing. Will you take an hour? Which we, which I pay him for. But will you take an hour and just give me your general thoughts, or two hours, or whatever it's going to take? And it's always helped me fine tune what I was doing visually. Yeah, and that's always that's always a good practice, I think, for for the kind of work that I do and the way that I do it is I need to ask questions. And sometimes those questions, the client doesn't understand why. Often I'll ask things that strike a client as as odd, like what is the exact purpose of what you're designing? And will it be on this medium? Will it be print? Will it be web? Will it be reused in this way? These kinds of things. Well, why do you need to know all that? Can't you just make something look really cool? Well, I can, but I need specs. I need to understand how it will be repurposed because an ad on the side of a moving car or a boat or a van is going to read very differently than a stationary thing. So I need to understand all of the uses right up front. Um, and I think I think having those preliminary conversations are benefit both the design process, so the designer, but also the client as well who, who's looking to sell an idea, a message, or a product. Great stuff there. You know, I was <coughs> out here, and thanks so much for these great insights. As we're closing out here, though, you do you do a fair number of uh, book covers for small publishers and independent authors. What what are some aspects of a good eye catching book cover? It's kind of a short list, really. Primary one is readability of the title, the author name. Um, this is why you're going to see and have seen forever so many big name authors with these large. Uh, word marks, all capital letters in a very simple font. They don't go flowery. They don't go too thin. 
They don't blend words with the background. It's all very readable. So many small publishing houses and independent authors put out book jackets that show off a designer's skill with the design app, whether it be Photoshop or what have you, but failing to realize that you have to have less and you have less than a second sometimes to catch the reader's eye. So it has to be very simple and basic, which is what I was saying off the hop about design in general right now. Honestly, I think making a book jacket look like another book jacket of the same type or genre, a book, is more likely to succeed than a super creative one that looks like nothing else. So there's, there's a little bit of that to designing book jackets, I think. It's like stickiness. You want the reader's eye to stick as she scrolls through maybe a hundred uh, book jackets or when bookstores reopen, walks past shelves of hundreds. Yeah, it's so, particularly when you're looking on Amazon or something and it's like a post, postage stamp size. Yeah, all, yeah, right? those thumbnail sizes. Another thing that goes with that is the high contrast. If you're going to have a dark palette for the imagery of the actual, you know, the actual design, then you, you want a highly negative white or very, very light shade of color to have that high contrast so that you're, you're able to see this title and hopefully the author name at the postage size thumbnail when you're scrolling. I actually always recommend authors of multiple books create a word mark mm. of their author name, which, has, which is basically the same font, the same positioning, the same style, and reuse it across multiple titles. So many authors and publishers just don't do this. I think mostly for titles they think are more literary, that, that somehow cheapens it or makes it, stamps it as a genre book. Mm. But I think that's okay now. I think you're going to see a lot more of that. Speaking as my, for myself as a writer and author of a few books, I, I just want to sell books. I really don't care if I don't look literary enough for people. I uh, So I love these this advice. So what, okay, really quickly as we're wrapping up here, uh, and it's, gosh, it's already gone so fast. I have to have you back here in the virtual lounge again soon, but are there like top three no-nos? You've already covered some of those for books, though, that you already kind of covered the things that you should do. Are there things that just, just scream at you when you see them and you're just like, oh, why do they do that? Yeah, of course. Too many words, too many words on, a, on the front of a book cover. Readers generally don't care who the publisher is, not unless it's part of the brand of the book, right. but you don't need Game Changer Press presents, and then the title of the book. Who cares? I mean, I, unless you're Harlequin or something, you know, the, a brand of book that is almost more important than who wrote it. I mean, Harlequin readers and other romance, you know, imprints, they're picking up that book because they know exactly what's inside. They don't necessarily care so much who actually wrote it. You know what I mean? So yeah. I would say um, in the too many words category, pull quotes, like 10 pull quotes on the front cover. If it's if it's one from, say, a trusted source like Kirkus, or if, say, John Grisham really liked your book. You better put yeah, it put, on there. Yeah, <laughs> put that on there. But save the paragraph of, of Grisham's praise for the back jacket. Well, it's like, uh, you know? well, it was, uh, I've seen the future of horror, and it is Clive Barker, said Stephen King, who made a career with that blurb for Clive Barker. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, so many so many authors will come to me and say, I need a, I need a cover. Just do something creative. Oh. Make it like nothing else out there. Now, if you're a big name author with tens of thousands of sales each year, that can work. But most trends in book jacket design were started on big name authors' books, and that was to differentiate. But if you're building an audience, you want the feel of it to not differentiate necessarily. Yes, you want the reader to be clear this is your book and not someone else in the same genre, but it usually becomes a conversation with me to the author about how making your book look incredibly fancy and new is likely to backfire. Now, tied up with that is this, this thing that I call, well, I didn't coin this, but everything in the kitchen sink approach to designing a book cover. That is, we need a dog on the cover. We need a boy, he's 12 years old. The dog should be fighting with a wolf. The wolf in my story is a fantasy creature. So it has these huge wings. There's a volcano that's super important to the finale of the book. So that needs to be on there. The lava is green, so that's got to be there. The sky is hazy and hot pink. Make sure, make sure about the pink sky. Oh, and the boy's wearing a baseball cap. It's red, and it has his dad's air conditioning repair logo on it. That's all got to be on the cover. 
which is ridiculous, right? right? It's going way too literal. It, you don't want to include every plot point or character of the book. Right. It would be messy, hard to understand, never mind readable on the cover. Don't make a comic book page, um, even if that's your genre. So what I usually do is I suggest one idea on the cover. So the example about the dog, I'd probably focus maybe on having maybe the back of the boy in a red baseball cap with a trusty dog at his side, and they're facing away as if they're maybe approaching a journey. I don't think there needs to be the wolf. I don't think there needs to be the volcano. Maybe, but probably not. What you're doing is you're hinting at the journey to come in the book. Right. If you've made that cover intriguing, it's become an invitation now. I like that. Okay, last question. Uh, business books versus fiction. What do I prefer or what? Oh, <laughs> sorry, on the covers. Because you don't see a lot of uh, like nonfiction uh, business books and things like that, or self-help even, that, that have the same things, right? It's usually just the title and it's it's more of a, there's a, there is a graphic design, but it's a different aesthetic altogether. It's a completely different aesthetic. Yeah, fiction versus um, fiction versus like a business type book or a nonfiction. Again, I would go with very straightforward readable and I would have one idea, one idea. I see you've finished off your virtual teeny already and I see that it's also getting to be last call and I guess we're gonna have to wrap this one up. Jason McIntyre, graphic designer and communications consultant. Thanks for appearing with us here at the virtual lounge. Well, thank you, Alex. I appreciate it. If somebody wants to get a hold of you, perhaps to consult with you or get some more information about what you do and what you can do for them, how might they do that? I would love it if people stopped by the website. It's called www.thefarthestreaches.com. And on there, you can see design examples. You can read a little bit about my fiction and uh, kind of learn about my approach to design and uh, get in touch with me through there. I'm active on social media as well. You can just search for Jason McIntyre and, and probably find me on all of those major channels. Yeah, and I'll just say this really quickly. I don't want to embarrass him too much, but his fiction is incredible and uh, it, it's well worth it, especially this time when you need to escape somewhere. Jason's f fiction provides ample, ample adventures and ample uh, journeys that you can go on that take you out of this uh, gloomy world of the pandemic. Again, Jason, thanks for being on PR After Hours here in the Virtual Lounge. Oh, you know what that means? Looks like it's last call here at your virtual lounge for PR news views and interviews. Don't forget, you can ask me a question anytime. You can do it through our Twitter account, which is at Hours PR, or even better, you can send me a message vocally. I would love to hear your voice, and I'll answer it on the show. There's a link in the show notes. All you have to do is sign up through Anchor FM. It's free, doesn't take long, and you record your message. I get the message. I will play your audio. Just give me your first name and the city you live in, and then I will answer the question to the best of my ability right here on the show. Don't forget, to if you're enjoying this podcast, you can support it and help increase the frequency and value of the show. Just consider being a sponsor for your brand or your agency or just yourself because you're like, I like this show. Or just drop a few coins in the virtual tip jar. Either way, there's links in the show notes. Please check that out. All of that, of course, being in the show notes where you're listening right now or at PRAfterHours.com. I see that they're turning up the lights. Last call is over and I've got to clean up this virtual lounge. And until next time, I'm Alex Greenwood and you've been listening to PR After Hours on Anchor FM.